Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for this very kind introduction. Thank you for having me here. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. So many friends, people I've read, like Lance, for years, who have been formative in my own thinking. So I'm really, really delighted to be here. Uh, hopefully, this will be productive and entertaining for you as well. So The News Gap is a book that came out a year and a half ago with MIT Press that I wrote together with my former advisee, Eugenia Michelstein, who's a professor in Argentina. Uh, so she should be credited with half or more of this. And she did this in parallel with her dissertation, which I don't advise. Uh, it took her nine years to finish uh, her degree because of this, but you know, she did a fabulous job and was a great, great collaborator on this. So the news gap is situated as an argument at the intersection of a long-standing debate among both scholars and practitioners about whether there is a divergence, there is a gap between the needs and the wants of informed citizens. Meaning that citizens, in order to function as informed members in a liberal democracy, need to know information about politics, about international affairs, about business, about economics. But what they really want to know right, is sports, okay, uh, weather, crime, celebrity. Right? It's the stuff that motivates you know, they are opening the pages of a newspaper, going on a news site like myself. As soon as I landed in Seattle, you know, three hours ago, I looked at my phone and I saw whether Real Madrid had defeated, you know, I think it was Elche or Almeria in Spain, so that there are only two points before Barcelona in the fight for the title of the Spanish League. Now, this debate has been around for a long, long time. Uh, Robert Park, who before becoming one of the founding members of the Chicago School of Sociology, was a newspaper person, wrote in the preface uh, of Helen Hughes' News and the Human Interest Story, the things which most of us would like to publish are not the things that most of us want to read. We may be eager to get into print what is or seems to be edifying, but we want to read what is interesting. And the debate really didn't start with Park either. We can trace, and we have traced, you know, in, among practitioners in particular, discussions about whether what, in, for newspapers, you know, 100 years ago, whether what they were publishing was the stuff that their readers really wanted or not. Now, this debate, right, going on for at least 75, probably 100 years, suggests to us that, yes, the gap might have existed before, right? The gap still exists today, I'm going to show you right, in a few minutes, but there is a difference between the gap before and the gap today, which is what motivated us to write the book and first to the project that led to the articles. In the world of news media up until 15, 20 years ago, there are three dimensions that are critical to understanding why such a gap existed right, um, and why its meaning for the media and its implications for democracy are different today. So if you look at the market power of traditional news organizations up until you know, the popularization, the commercialization of the web, uh, we see a situation of very high market power, either natural monopolies or natural oligopolies in their respective marketplaces. Newspapers in America, for instance, in 97% of the towns had a natural oligopoly position, only one player in town. Which means that if a merchant wanted to reach the population, right, it had to advertise in that newspaper. Right? And therefore, a newspaper could publish, or the editors could publish whatever they thought it was important, right? because they were still going to get funding. Borrowing from Andy Abbott's work you know, on the system of professions, the jurisdictional space of journalists was quite strong. There was not the invasion of bloggers, tweeters, etc., etc., that exists today. Therefore, they had much more control over the production and circulation of information than what is happening today. And finally, because of the affordances of traditional print and broadcast media, when people wanted to avoid politics, which we know, going back even to Downs you know, in the 50s, or Shatson with monitor the notion of monetary citizenship, etc., if they wanted to avoid that, it was much more difficult before than what it is now. Because if you were interested in a story on page 15 of the newspaper, you would at least stumble upon the front page and what was covered before. If you were looking at you know, the sports segment in the newscast at 9 p.m. or 8 p.m. that came in fifth place, you had to see through the first four. 
Now, the world has changed dramatically for the news media, for many other things in the past uh, 20 years or so, in particular in the past 10 years. First of all, there's much, much more competition for advertising in the case of news, right? Uh, and that's one reason why, for instance, for online news, more than 66 cents of every dollar spent on online advertising is going to five organizations, none of which are in the business of producing news. And you can figure out which they are. The jurisdictional space of journalists has been seriously weakened, and that is mounting on a crisis of credibility that predates this, but only exacerbates right, the sense of increased competition and decreased ability right, to hold the public in front of you and attentive to you. And finally, the affordances of digital media make much more easy for us to avoid the stuff that we are not interested in and focus entirely our time devoted to news consumption on the things that we really care about. So again, even if we think that uh, the gap existed before, right? even as I'm gonna you know, argue in a few minutes, nobody really measure that, the gap today has a very different kind of meaning for the news media that it had before and for the role of the news media in a democratic society or in liberal democracy as it is understood in normative theories. So given that this debate has been around, this discussion about whether there is a gap or not, how big, etc., uh, has been around for a long time, it was surprising to us when we started doing this research to find that there is a relative dearth of empirical studies that systematically have measured the existence of the gap, which are the factors that increase it, which are the factors that decrease it, and what consequences it has for the media and for the societies in which they operate. Most of this debate has been either discursive or ideological. And the few systematic empirical studies that exist on this have had three, in general, have shared three important limitations. The first one, because they focus on technologies before digital media, they focus on aggregate measures of news consumption, circulation, ratings, etc. But that is much less applicable today in which our choices in the current media environment, our choices are much more driven by particular stories rather than by the consumption of an entire newspaper or sitting 30 minutes in front of television with undivided attention. So we did our research focusing on online news, looking at stories, the consumption of particular stories and the level of analysis for us, therefore, was the story level of analysis. The second limitation is that most of the studies that predate our work looked at choice, the choices of journalists, looking, for instance, doing content analysis of front page news or top of the hours news stories, etc., and comparing that with secondary evidence about what readers, viewers, listeners might want, or vice versa, surveys or focus groups of the public, and contrasting those results with secondary sources about uh, what the media present as the most important stories of the day. But there are very few studies that examine what the media offer and what the public want concurrently. The third limitation is that most of the research has uh, taken a cross-sectional approach, or had taken a conceptual approach, and therefore implicitly conceived the choices of the media and the public as static. It's not that the researchers would say, yes, we, we think that the choices remain you know, at T1, T2, T3, T4. No, but implicitly, by not looking at the evolution of choices, uh, you know, news choices longitudinally, right, they gave an impression that the news media had overall always the same kind of supply of information, and in particular, the public always wanted the same thing. So what we did in our work that started with one small research project and then we, had, we were left with more questions than answers, so we did another one and in the end we did four of them that became a series of articles and a book, was to try to empirically quantify right, how big is this gap. Right? First, whether it exists or not, we sort of knew it existed, but really how big are we talking about? Right? And whether that magnitude changes according to depending circ to different circumstances, therefore trying to move away from this idea that these choices are static. Secondly, do it in a way that methodologically overcomes these three limitations, that theoretically contributes to understanding which are the factors that increase this gap, that decrease it, or that make no difference whatsoever, and to present an argument that calls attention 
to this part. And this is the reason why we wrote the book after publishing half a dozen articles, because we wanted to you know, try to give some circulation to these ideas outside of the academy. Because we do think that the gap today threatens the economic viability of the public service mission of journalism, and therefore might have terrible consequences for the contributions of media to the health of democratic life. What do I mean by that? Just a couple of points. Probably I'm rehearsing arguments that all of you know here, but putting them together in just one slide to sort of raise awareness about the sense of urgency. If we think about the media today, right, the three largest media companies in the world did not exist before the 90s. Right? As of a couple of weeks ago, Apple was 350 times bigger than the New York Times Corporation. And therefore, that's the reason why the New York Times announced very recently, as you probably know, that they are experimenting with a new storytelling format, which is one-sentence stories for the iWatch. Okay? That is a wonderful metaphor about difference in market power. And we are talking about the New York Times. Why? Because they are bleeding money and people and resources left and right. The Guardian, you know, you can read the stats, you probably know all of them, but this is remarkable. The Guardian, which, as you know, is funded by a trust, right, um, was losing between 10 and 12, 2010 and 2012, 100,000 pounds a day. That is 150,000 pounds a day. It's, I mean, we can do the math, it's a lot of money per minute. Right? It's about, I think, 80 pounds every second that I'm giving this talk. Right? Which is the reason why, in part, right, they fired a remarkable managing editor that brought some of the most important news stories of our time, because the trust will be depleted quite soon if they continue losing money right? like this. And we're talking about The Guardian, which is outside of the US, the most important news source in the English-speaking language for the liberal-leaning public. Because of all these you know, layoffs, closing of newspapers, closing of, you know, the Sun Times, for instance, lost its entire photojournalism department a couple of years ago, right? The second newspaper in the third largest city in America. Because of all of this, we have been having, unfortunately in society, a natural experiment of what it is, you know, that takes place when news disappears. It's not just a theoretical exercise. Now it's a natural experiment, and there are, there are now series of papers showing that a decrease in public affairs news supply is correlated with elections that are less competitive, officials that are less responsive to their local constituencies, and citizens that know less and that are much less engaged with matters of the polity. They vote less and they are in general much more apathetic than what they used to be. So in the past, you know, 15 years ago, this was all theoretical based on normative theory. This that now actually we have an experiment going on and the research is quite consistent across these different dimensions. So that's why we argue that this research matters now. It's not just an empirical exercise, it's not just a methodological exercise or a theoretical exercise all combined. It's about understanding what is the future of news. In particular, the news outlets that traditionally have set the agenda in their respective societies and have played a very important role in the metrics that connects communication, politics, and media in their respective countries. So I'm not going to show this because we don't have time. Um, so those of you who know me uh, know that I'm trained as an ethnographer. So I'm going to tell a story with numbers here, but I'm still going to try to tell a story. Um, and it's a story based on four studies. The first one uh, is the one that where we developed the methodology, and the methodology is very simple. So we went in the first study to four different news sites, CNN, Yahoo, the three, and your very own Seattle PI, that at the time we collected research actually had a print edition, and now, as you know, it doesn't. And we looked at, at different points in time, different days of the week, different weeks of the month, etc at their top 10 most prominently displayed stories. Having done a lot of ethnographies inside online newsrooms, I know that homepage editors prioritize space on the first scroll of the screen, more or less the same way that front page editors do for print newspapers. So if we divide, imagine this is your computer screen, lab, you know, 
tablet screen, etc. If you divide the screen in a grid like we did, usually there is a left green, a, a, a left column, a middle column, a right hand side column, and then there is a first row, second row, third row. The top story is there usually. Then that's a story about public affairs. Then you have a story here, or if not here, that softens that, that is about weather or sports, etc. But homepage editors prioritize news and tell us what to pay attention to by how they place stories on the homepage. So we went on these four sites and we said we're going to divide the screen in three columns and three to four rows. And we're going to say story one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we're going to take those ten stories as a proxy for the most newsworthy stories of the day or of the hour or of the minute for these homepage editors, right? And we are going to contrast that with the top 10 most clicked stories that come under the labels of most popular, most visited, etc. But they really are people, stories that people click on the most. We are also going to look at, whenever available, information about the most email stories on the site, not if I, you know, clip the URL and send it to Matt, but if through the site I send it to Matt, and the stories that are most commented on, okay? And then we have basically that as expressions of different forms of demand for information, need or interest, right, for information. For every story, we are going to do two very simple analyses. First, what is the story about, right, the subject matter, the main topic that the story is covering. And there we have two very basic categories, the need and the wants. The, what we call public affairs news, national news, international news, business and um, economics, on the one hand. On the other hand, the rest, which is 90% of that is celebrity, weather, crime and sports. Okay? And then we are also going to look at how the stories are told. Right? Whether they are told as straight news, you know, the five W's, etc. Whether they are feature style journalism whether they are com you know, opinion pieces, op-eds, editorials, etc., whether they are blogs or user-generated content, right? Three native formats online. So for every story, we are going to do that, okay? If there is a gap, there should be a difference in the proportion of public affairs news in terms of the top 10 most newsworthy news, most prominently displayed, versus the others, and, you know, in terms of the content or the subject matter, okay? I'm going to show you the results of the four studies. Overall, it's 20 different news sites, leading news sites in their respective countries, seven different countries, Germany, Spain, UK, US, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina. All combined at the time we did the first draft, full draft of the book about 20 months ago, give or take. Combined, they had a quarter billion monthly unique visitors. Now they are in the 300 and something probably. Most important, they are the outlets that really set the agendas in their respective countries. We have The Guardian, we have Welt, we have El País, we have Washington Post, we have CNN, we have L'Universal, we have Folly in Brazil, we have La Nación in Argentina. Okay, first study. We did that contrast. It was in the spring to summer of 2007. Four sites, two from Metro, newspapers, one from broadcast, a pure player, very simple analysis. Let's look at the proportion of public affairs news in the supply and in the demand for information. What you see on your left-hand side here is the proportion of public affairs news among the top 10 most newsworthy stories for the journalists here, CNN, for instance, and immediately to the right, the most clicked stories. Okay, so you see variance across the site, but there is something that unites all these sites. Okay? which is a sizable gap that average across the 20 sites that we looked at, 19 percentage points. Okay? Now, there is a possibility that we click or we get interested, disproportionately interested as members of the public, in stories that are very prominently displayed, you know, above the fold, right? In the newspaper, top of the hour, you know, first quadrant here, right? There is a way in which perhaps that shapes our interest in a story, right? Conversely, there is a way, you know, I know after spending many, many, many months inside online newsrooms, there is a way in which traffic measures 
actually affect editorial decision making. Homepage editors are constantly looking at this information. So it is possible that there is a story that they would never put in the first scroll, maybe in the third scroll, or maybe never on a homepage, but it's, as they say, measuring so well that they put it up, right? And then they feed that story. So there is a way in which each group influences the other, right? So to get at more pure preferences of both the media and the public, we did a secondary analysis of this data and of all the other sites that we looked at, which was at any given point in time, and actually I could use the transparency now to show that, at any given point in time, imagine two lists of 10 stories, right? There are some stories that are gonna show up in both lists, okay? They could be in both lists because the media is disproportionately influencing the public or the public is shaping the editor's view. So what we did is we took all these stories and we extracted, we moved the stories that appear in both lists out. And then we did a secondary analysis only with the stories that appear in one list but not the other. That would give us a more pure expression perhaps of the gap, right? Of you know, both sets of interests. L keep this in mind, look at what happens when I only look at stories that appear in one and not the other. The gap in CNN becomes a 50 percentage point gap. Right? So the editors at CNN left to their own devices will push public affairs journalism as much as they can and their readers will not pay almost any attention to that. Okay? So does the gap exist? Yes. Is it big? Yes. Is it really shaped by whether you are in broadcast journalism or you are a pure player or you are a you know, large metro or a mid-sized metro? Not really in terms of the basics. But is it a U.S. malaise, right? Or does it apply to other parts of the world? Not necessarily to the entire world because we couldn't measure that, but I mean to contexts outside of the U.S. that have different media systems, different media structures, different policy regulations, and different really reading and viewing cultures. So to get at that, we deployed the same methodology in a second study where we looked at 11 news sites in this case, all belonging to national newspapers. Right? We wanted to keep that constant in order to make comparisons easier. In six different countries, as I said before, UK, Germany, US, in Europe, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, in Latin America. Two sites per country, one on the conservative side of the spectrum, the other on the progressive side of the spectrum to get a sense that potential influences of ideology, right? That's a self-selection mechanism. The only exception is Brazil, where we only found a suitable site that made this information publicly available. I made a decision early on in the research not to go with data that I was not publicly available because I didn't want any strings attached in terms of how we present the findings from uh, the news organization. So that's why in Brazil, we didn't have anything that we could compare Folia de Sao Paulo to. So, the study took place between the fall of 07 and the spring of 08. Everything here is statistically significant. There are more than 50,000 stories hand coded, you know, native speakers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I'm not displaying uh, that information. The results, again, lots of differences sometimes across uh, countries, but something that unites all of this. Sorry, I get outside, out of the way that cuts across these differences is against the presence of very sizable gap between the supply of information and demand of information. My favorite example is where the gap is the largest across all the sites, which is The Guardian, right? The leading site for the liberal intelligentsia, the gap is 31 percentage points. So, quiz. What was happening in the UK or in people who would be interested in going to The Guardian, in the fall of 07 through the spring of 08, that would lead to these results. Hmm? Recession? Recession? What else? The news of the world that wasn't shaping this, but what else? Is there a wedding, a royal wedding? No. 
or maybe there was, but that's not as attractive as Sir Alex Ferguson, who was then at the time manager of Manchester United, who was then a powerhouse in the world of soccer. And Cristiano Ronaldo, who now plays for Madrid, was playing for Manu. And my compatriot, Carlos Tevez, was their leading striker. So people will go to The Guardian, right, and they will click on Manu. Right? And it was consistent. I mean, Cristiano was driving traffic left and right, which is why Florentino Perez, you know, the president of Real Madrid, paid what he paid to get Cristiano to go to Madrid because of the advertising dollars, not necessarily because of winning a league or the Champions League. So could there be any difference based on ideology or region? Because, you know, Brazil and Germany, the, you know, the media systems, the political, you know, the policy regulations, the viewing habits, it's all very different, right? I mean, we are not comparing cases. I mean, Spain and Argentina, there are many more similarities, but not necessarily Brazil and Germany, for instance. So could there be a case that is different in Western Europe than in Latin America? And I'm using these countries as proxies for these regions. So I'm not covering the entire region. Could it be that those of us on the left are more enlightened than those of them on the right, right? In order to get at this, at some of the factors that shape or do not shape the gap, we group together then all this data from the different regions, right? And from the different ideologies and try to see whether there was a difference or not. So regionally, no difference. This is not surprising because the leading editors of the leading news organizations in the world are trained in the same ways. They go to the same World Association of Newspaper Conferences, etc., and they advise to McKinsey and Booz Allen and the same you know, consultants do jure on the editorial side. But this is really striking. And this speaks a lot about the globalization of popular taste. That in general, in aggregate, and this is a 30,000 view of news consumption, right? 30,000 know, feet view of news consumption, but on aggregate, there is no difference here, right? Quite remarkable. Left and right, the same. Unfortunately, those of us on the, left, on the left are no more enlightened than folks on the right side of the spectrum. So we know the gap exists. We know it's large. We know it cuts across regions of the world, at least leading media outlets in regions of the world that have very different media uh, structures, very different regulation policies, very different uh, reading cultures or viewing cultures. Um, we know that ideology doesn't seem to make a difference. Uh, we know, therefore, that you know, region as a proxy for culture doesn't seem, in this particular case, to make a difference. Does politics make a difference? We were pondering these questions as, at the time that, you know, and one in the, in the research team and one of the research assistants said, well, we could actually, if you, if you get us more money, uh, we can actually track this in a natural experiment because the U.S. election was coming up, right? Remember, I finished this data collection for the previous project right in the run-up to the election. So we got more money and we deployed the same methodology in a study of six leading news sites online in the U.S., Washington Post, USA Today, from the world of national print newspapers, ABC and CBS, national television networks, and Fox and CNN, national broad news uh, on the cable side. And we had the good fortune, the misfortune as citizens, but the good fortune of researchers of doing this at a time in which a trillion dollars evaporated. So it's not only the fact that the country was about to elect uh, a president, maybe the first female president, maybe the first African-American president after eight years of a highly contested administration, shall we say. But also, if there is a time in which people should care about financial news is when a trillion dollars or a few or two or three get evaporated, right? Lehman Brothers closed, you know, the world was coming to an end, McCain suspends his campaign. You have all the ingredients there, right? I mean, you know, if, if we had dreamed of a better natural experiment, we couldn't have found one. So in 2008, we went on these sites roughly three weeks before the first national convention, and we ended roughly three weeks after the national election. Election day was November 4th or 5th, I can't remember, one or two. Uh, for every week, we collected between four and five days a week. With the exception of around election day, we collected 14 consecutive days. Day of election, 10 days before, three days after. Okay? Same methodology, same old, same old. Then, Eugenia had the good fortune of saying, well, actually, if we really want to make sure 
that we see longitudinal differences. We can't rely on this study in comparison to the first study that I showed you because there are different sites. If we want to make something really clean, we should track the evolution of the entire electoral cycle in the same site. So in November, the exact same 14 days in November 09, no elections, we went on the same sites, we collected data. Same 14 days during Congress, the midterm congressionals, same 14 days in 11, and then we deployed the same four month you know, apparatus for the 2012 Obama re-election campaign. So we have the, the model right, cycle in American politics covered in this election. This is tens of thousands of stories. This in and of itself is, you know, <laughs> was the bulk of the 50,000 stories. So does politics make a difference? You bet. Right? Did Michael Shadson get it right? Yes. So this is a different way of showing you the data. This shows you the size, the average size of the gap and the size of the gap per site, evolving according to the years. The gap is lower. This is the, the gap is the yellow line. The gap is lower during the 08 election because there was still a sense of a contested election. Moves a little bit higher, but still is lower than the other years during 2012 when Mitt Romney was clear that I was never going to win despite the media covering this as a horse rate, Nate Silver got it right from the first day and even before then, which is why he was fired or so from the New York Times, or at least he sort of decided to leave. It's mid-size during uh, the midterm election, and it's very high, right, more than 20 percentage points in the off years. There is no stickiness, there is no spillover effect, no nothing. As Michael wrote many, many years ago, People only pay attention when the media sounds the alarm and there is something really at stake for them, right? Which is what happens here and here. When there is nothing really major that people think there is at stake for them, the gap is 20 plus percentage points. So what makes this change? Why does politics make a difference? Politics makes a difference. Does it make a difference because of the behavior of the media or does it make a difference because of the behavior of the public or both? To track that, we look at the evolution of the gap on a weekly basis during the 08 and the 2012 campaign. Okay? So this is what we could call interannual variation. This is intraannual variation. So this is August 1, sorry, week 1. Okay? This is December 1, week 18 of the 18 weeks of coverage. Election day was week 15. This is the supply of information on the media, percentage of public affair news among the top 10 most newsworthy, most prominently displayed stories, right? You have six news organizations here. There is some variance between them, but what is interesting is that first, but this is not very interesting, it's obvious based on the literature, they move in a pack, right? It doesn't matter where you are, Fox or The Post, in general, there is a band. All of them have more than X, right? Second, if you plot a logistic regression here, you can actually say that with every week that the election nears, there is an increase in the probability that the media will supply public affairs, news stories as the most important stories of the day, that average 3% a week, right? So it's, the behavior of the media is extremely predictable. Whether you see it, you know, on the right, whether you see it more on the liberal side, where you come here from there, media gives us more or less the same, okay? Do we want more or less the same, depending on what we look at? Oops, no. This is us, okay? Consistent with what we know from theory, Fox consumers, the Fox public is completely tuned out after McCain blunders. Right? Completely tuned out. And this reverses in the 2011 midterm where the CNN people are tuned out because the Tea Party is doing quite well. Okay? But most importantly, look at the consistency in how the news is you know, supplied to the population regardless of where you sit in terms of outlet and look at the diversity of behavior among the public based on what they click, not on what they tell you in a survey that they read or watched or talked about the day before, okay? Because that's different from, yeah, no, that, that story about Afghanistan, boy, I spent like 30 minutes just reading and this. This is what people actually click, register by the servers of these organizations, okay? No focus groups, no ethnographic interview. This is what people actually do. 
So why does politics make a difference? Because of variance in the interest of the public. Okay? How am I doing with time, Matt? Okay, so does politics make a difference when we are less primed, right? Elections are very cyclical, consistent, and high profile events in the life of a country. We are primed, in a sense, to pay attention to them, and there is a lot at stake. Does the same happen during a major political crisis that erupts out of nowhere and vanishes we don't know when, right? We were fortunate enough that during the second study in, our, in Argentina, there was a massive political crisis that really came out of nowhere, unless you were in the insider group, that you know, made the economy minister resign, uh, put the vice president at odds against the president, and the president at the time actually thought about resigning. So we looked at this same process again, right, in the context of a major political event that is not programmed, is not scheduled, and people are not necessarily primed for. And Exact same result. So this is 24 weeks of coverage. The crisis happens these five weeks between 18 and uh, 23rd. And you see a lot more divergence before this happens. And then the choices become much closer. This is another way of representing this. Before right, the crisis, significant important gap. During the political crisis, the gap disappears. The gap decreases remarkably here, too. Why? So during this crisis, actually two months later, my co-author went to Argentina and did interviews with 12 editors at online news sites, the two we studied, and about eight more, and with 25 readers of these news organizations' products. So what you see here right, is an expression of the journalists, the main ideas, the main beliefs that the journalists have about why they do what they do. Do they know this gap exists? Of course. Right? Do they have much more information than us? Yes. Is it much more painful than for me? Yes. Does that make them change in this particular time? Right? Does that make them change their behavior a lot? No. Right? Why? Because of issues of occupational culture, first quote. Second quote, because of the power of the brand. And a brand that is consistent with certain kind of journalism, they feel would be eroded significantly if it moved to a different space. Why is it that the public doesn't want this kind of news? And why is it that the gap decreases so dramatically during periods of heightened political activity? The public doesn't want this kind of information because it demands much more in the way of cognitive resources, because the news are very anxiety provoking, and because their sense of self-efficacy is exceedingly low. Right? They think that's why they are rationally ignorant. They say, what can I do about this? They're all crooks. Nothing is going to ever change. But why do they pay attention during high periods of heightened political activity? Because they think that their own well-being as citizens is at stake. So they need to acquire information that helps them navigate ef that effectively. As soon as the crisis is over, as soon as they vote, they, go, they get out of there. Right? They get out of that mode. So news organizations have been discussing this in relation to the crisis in the news for quite some time. Consultants said about 35 years ago, OK, Let's smuggle public affairs journalism through soft news storytelling, right? Matt Baum at Harvard actually wrote a fabulous book about this, right? Foreign affairs news covered through soft news programming. Bill Clinton visiting, you know, our senior hall in MTV, playing the saxophone, getting a youth vote. You have it all the way, right? Is it possible that that is the case, that, you know, the gap actually doesn't exist when we talk about uh, storytelling formats, so that storytelling formats might be a solution to this. Most recently, with digital media, people say, no, yes, the media are in crisis. One of, you know, Mako's uh, collaborators, Johai Benkler, say the issue has to be resolved bottom up. It's about peer production culture. It's about people taking ownership, right, of the production and circulation of information. We can do that through blogs, 
and we actually do that through blogs, and we do that through user-generated content, right? So are we the solution? Are we, mean members of public, the solution to that or not? No in both cases, if the clicker works. First of all, 60% of the most click uh, stories are straight news, okay, across the board. Yes, there is a little bit of a gap, but, and I show you what happens when we combine topic with storytelling format, but overall, what people want are straight news. Do people care about the content in blogs? No, right? It's consumed much less often than what is supplied. Do people care about what other people write in CNN, I report this or that? No, not at all, right? And that content usually is not public affairs news anyway when people click. It's about the recipes for turkey in Thanksgiving. It's about stories of that kind. What happened when we combined what the news are about with how they are told? There is consistently an oversupply of public affairs news told in straight news format and an undersupply of everything else. So it's not really about the format, it is about the content. How does technology matter? And I'm rushing because I want to make you know, the time. How does technology matter? Right? There are different ways in which we consume news and interact with the news online, right? Three of them, right, the three modal ones in terms of what leading news organizations do, have to do with our ability to click so that we can read or watch, right, or listen to, our ability to share, right, through the site. I'm not talking sharing a social media site, not talking about sharing through my own, uh, you know, personal email, etc. and about our ability to comment, right, on stories for the entire world to see. So, Sharing on email, right, is more about sharing with a known network of friends and family. Commenting is about discussing with the entire world. So what do we click on? We click on stuff that is interesting, that grabs immediately our attention. This is a typical top most click news story. Somebody sits at the bus, somebody else sits next to that person, First person tries to, 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 to strike a conversation, uh, the other person is not replying, still you know, tries to do that, and the other person gets pissed off and chopped the head off. Right? So now he gets decapitated, and that becomes, as you imagine, a major sort of new story, and is followed for days, days across sites. Um, what is the stuff that we want to click on? We want to click on the stuff that is bizarre. That's the best way of describing it. In the middle of the financial crisis, a foreclosed home, the bank goes there, right? The, the bank officer to take you know, a possession of the home, and they found a 44 pound cut. And the size of the cut was so overwhelming that the cut makes it to live with Regis and Kelly right? and becomes the most email story in USA Today that day for several news cycles. What is the stuff? that we most comment on the important stuff. We comment on the stuff that is controversial. Political news, mostly sometimes international news. What you have to understand is that there is a minority, if you look at volume of activity server side, right, it's much more clicking than commenting or emailing, well, several orders of magnitude. Which is why these are three sites where we did a comparative analysis in the US, CNN, Washington Post, USA Today, the gap is always the biggest between the most email and the most newsworthy, because the most email is really all about non-public affairs news. And the gap is, you know, sometimes even reversed between the most comment and the most newsworthy. Okay, because people comment on public affairs stuff that is controversial. So, to conclude, do I have five? Yeah, great. So, empirically, what we try to do is to measure the magnitude of this gap, right? And what we have shown is that the gap is relatively large. There is no really, no, no organization or sector of the economy that in a competitive market can compete by having 20% of the products that they put out there being unsold on a daily, weekly, hourly, monthly, annual basis. That doesn't happen, right? It happens for utilities because you have no other choice than to turn the faucet on if you want your water. But it doesn't happen in a competitive market. It's large and it's regular. 
in terms of in the sense that it really applies to a very very broad spectrum of leading news organizations. We're not talking about the tabloid market here. We're talking about this kind of organization. But within this segment of the market, right, it applies quite across the board. We wouldn't have been able to do this kind of research if we hadn't deployed, developed and deployed this methodology that overcomes the three limitations that I described before. Theoretically, it shows that some factors, like the political context and technological affordances matter. But Others do not. In particular, we were surprised by this. I wasn't surprised by this, but I was quite surprised by how little variance there is depending on the countries we study. So, to go back to the beginning, why does this matter? Part of our argument is that in the same way that one word in two different sentences can mean two different things, one historical phenomenon can mean two different things in different periods. A hundred years ago, or 75 years ago, when Robert Park wrote what he wrote, the gap signified the power of the media to set the agenda and tell the population what they ought to think about, despite the perception, much more indirect, but perception, however, that you know, the public was less interested about these issues than the media. Today, the gap signifies concerns about the economic viability of the public service mission of journalism and the viability, therefore, and the longevity of the contributions that the media have, or this sec part of the media sector, have historically played in liberal democracies. And in that sense, it does, we argue, perhaps suggest a break in the matrix that connected communication, media, and politics during the 20th century. It's very difficult to set the agenda if nobody is listening, right? Or if, not nobody, I'm exaggerating, but if a significant portion of the population is not listening. So the media still sets the agenda for the elites, but much less so than for the general public. And the agenda for the elites is in part dependent on the agenda for the general public. That is, politicians, uh, you know, corporate folks, etc., are paying a lot of attention to the media under the premise that the media are very powerful in terms of, you know, shaping what their constituencies are thinking about or are discussing or are talking about. The less influence that is taking place, the less power that the media have to set the agenda for the elites and therefore the less attention that the elites will pay, right? eventually, not now, but in years to come. The media have historically performed a watchdog role that have, has been extremely important, not only in catching cases of wrongdoing, you know, Watergate is, you know, globally, not just in America, a symbol of that, but more importantly because it, it has a deterrence factor, right? Public officials, corporate officers are sometimes deterred from doing these things for fear of being caught, not only by law enforcement officers, but also by the media. These stories are stories that take an enormous amount of resources to produce and that are not followed, not you know, clicked, not viewed, not read, commensurate with those levels of resources. So the gap does present today a disincentive to perform this controlling function. And finally, it pres presents a disincentive to contribute right, ideas, information, Etc. to the public sphere in a way that can motivate public deliberation and political participation. So with this very, very rosy picture, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, the horse race coverage, et cetera. That's not what came out. I, I, I don't know based on you know, the data uh, from the clicks, but from the interviews uh, that, that we did and the interviews that I did for my previous book, where I did a more sort of sustained ethnographic study of what actually drives news consumption, 
Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. It's more about me than it's about how it's presented to me. That there is much more at stake for me during an election than whether it's told in this way, that way, um, etc. Because they, so the, an alternative to this, no, it's an alternative. It's it's another way of telling the stories. Okay. Homepage traffic is about, let's say, 40, 42% on average on these sites during this time period. Okay, it was a little bit more before, will be a little bit less in the future, but still, it's about 40%. So the rest is all the stories that people click. So it is possible that people are consuming, you know, public affairs information from the headlines, and therefore the strategy of the New York Times to do, you know, one sentence stories, which is a headline basically on the phone is enough because that's all that people take, right? Uh, and then click on other things. So people are informed, you know, at the headline level, right? And then they click uh, on something else. But the clicking behavior really is motivated by what's in it for me and what do I need to live my life this particular day? Um, I can elaborate on that, but if there are any questions, I sort of can take them. Kirsten. Yep. Yes, but that's how the book started actually. I was doing the ethnography for News at Work and I was sitting in the office of the head of the national uh, news beat at the largest uh, newspaper in Argentina and you know, he was telling me about a major expose that they had been working on and they had started you know, putting some you know, st you know, uh, stories out there, planting the seeds for something bigger and then um, he, as he's talking to me, he sees the real time stats of news on the site and the most clicked story of the day at the time was a story about a third year Argentine tennis player that had made it to the semi-finals of some sort of regional uh, tournament. So n n nothing really very important. And he looks at me and I say, I can't compete with this guy. There is, there is no way I can compete with this guy. And we are not talking about a mega star, we are talking about just a tennis player. Right? Slow news day, you know, there was no soccer, so it was just tennis. So, Journalists live this, they have historically lived this tension, right? Um, they live it day in, day out. At the time we did this research, occupational culture trumped market dynamics. I believe the process is very insidious and because cultures change very slowly, but eventually we will see, right? Uh, in part, we are seeing some of that going on based on anecdotal you know, evidence that I get from people inside different news organizations where they get much more pressure if a story is doing very well and it's not very important to keep feeding that story and they move resources away from that. However, there is still, the, uh, the occupational culture is still very strong. When I was beginning to do, just to do a com historical comparison within the same organization, when I was beginning to do this research, I was part of a group on science journalism that had a mix of you know, science journalists and um, scholars and scientists. So I presented some very preliminary findings and Corey Dean, who had been the founding editor for Science Times, um, said, you know, when I became editor, the section I was sent to um, management boot camp for the Times, right? So I went away on a weekend and I learned that you know, our marketing department had a lot of information, focus group surveys, this, that, about our readers, right? So on Monday I show up, right, at the paper and I tell my editor that I wanted to see that information and use it to plan, you know, my coverage. And the editor said, no, never. You will compromise, right, the integrity right, of your values, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. There is a student at NYU, Catherine Petrie, who has done research at the Times in the past couple of years on a chart bit, trying to look at um, how information part about the public and metrics are consumed. And what part of what the story is at the Times still, the Times editors still try to shield their reporters from this information. So this is in an organization that 
two years ago, I believe, sold the Boston Globe, which they had acquired for $1.1 billion in 1992. They sold it 20 or 21 years later for less than 100. And if you adjust by inflation, they lost about 96 cents on the dollar. So even in an organization that is bleeding money and stuff left and right, they still upheld, right? Um, so cultures change very, very, very slowly. Yes. So as I see from Gaspring, the discussion is going to exponent, right? As our consumer moves, I'm putting in more into public affairs tools because I'm determined to have the mm -hmm. business. Do you see anything as you look at all this in terms of conventions? Right. I mean, we talk about storytelling, but conventions that would basically front the relevance of this. So trying to make the argument for impact within the uh, company. Right. So that's why we did the storytelling analysis, but it's very it's not very granular, shall we say, right? We divide it by categories. So with, with more than 50,000 observations hand-coded, because there was no computer coding, there was, you know, so I just didn't have the, the, to hire enough people to actually go through, right? A, a significant number of them. I know the literature and I know what consultants advise, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure that the horse race, you know, um, formulation, for instance, has in part the effects that it has. I do believe that that is trumped by me, right? By what is in it for me. My folk theory about why people read the news, watch the news, listen to the news, etc., is that it is not that they want to be informed, they is that they want to have something to talk about, right? And it is much more it's much safer interpersonally, right? And benign psychologically to talk about sports, weather, and entertainment, slash celebrity, right? And crime is something that we love to hate, right, in a sense, than to talk about <coughs> the rest. So there was a great, great study that Bonnie Erickson, a sociologist at the University of Toronto, did many years ago about what is that people talk about in factory settings, right? What, what, what do people talk about with their coworkers, right? And she found out that the number one topic of conversation is sports. And her conclusion in that uh, research is that that is the case because it is a subject matter that allows people to cross ideological and class barriers in a fairly benign manner, right? That if you talk about politics, if you talk about money, etc., it becomes complicated. Right? Um, so that's why I think that, yes, there are ways of enticing. If it bleeds, it leads, and all of that, right? Some of those ways of enticing do generate a saturation effect, right? Um, but overall, it's more about understanding the role that the encounter with the object plays in everyday life. This is the anthropologist in me speaking, right? But it is, so wh why am I spending time with this, right? What am I getting at? What role does it play in my daily life? Given that the time that I spend is very, very, that's the other thing that is important to keep in mind. Probably you all know this, but I, I will just remind it here. Um, on average, like two years ago, which was the last time I, I looked at the data, so the stickiest of online news sites, that is the site online, for online news where people spend the most time is CNN, or was CNN, maybe something else now. The average time, right, on a, you know, for, if you look at all the usage over a month, per day, per unique user, was 29 seconds, okay? So that means that there is 10% which is spending, you know, 29 minutes, and 90% is spending two seconds, basically, right? So there isn't a whole lot that you can do in 29 seconds if we take that as the average. By way of comparison, and it goes back to why this matters now so much, at that same time, Facebook, people sp were spending 14 times more on Facebook on a regular basis, on a daily basis. And Facebook had 1.2 subscribers in the planet, or 2 billion subscribers in the planet. So just to move beyond the statistics into more anecdote type evidence, 2008 campaign in the US between August and December. So 
for all these sites, we collected over 4,000 stories among the most clicked stories, right? We have six sites. There were 11 events that were covered in stories that made it to the top 10 most clicked list in all of those sites, right? So there were 66 stories, right? 11 events, because we have six sites, that were sort of, there were stories that metaphorically, not, not, not I mean, I'm not making any sort of um, statistical, statistical arguments. That met metaphorically, are the stories that capture the imagination of the mainstream American public, as we were talking about, right? Um, at a period in which the country is electing a president after, again, a highly contested administration, and people are losing money left and right, and homes and life savings. How many of these 11 events do you think were about public affairs subject matters? This include, you know, the election of Obama, the closing on Le of Lehman, all of that. So how many? Take a guess. Eight of the 11, okay. Another number? Three, Three two, okay. None, None okay. Uh, one. Which, which story was that? Which event was that that on the public affairs side really captured the attention across the board from Fox to the Post? No, but it shows that you, are the, you know about politics, you are on the right track. Uh, no Sarah Palin. No, she's not, you know, interesting enough. John Edwards, mistress, wife dying of cancer. That was the story. And we called it that as a public affairs news, right, on the most conservative side. Five of the 11 were about natural disasters, three about one hurricane, two about the other. Um, and the most highly ranked, that was one, 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 two, and three, or something like that, was about Hurricane Ike, I believe. The other stories were the killing of uh, Jennifer Hudson's uh, nephew in, in a highway in, in Chicago, uh, the killing of uh, the relative of an athlete, e an American athlete in the Beijing Olympics, uh, the death of Bernie Mac, um, and my favorite one was sighting of Bigfoot, the monster, uh, somewhere uh, up north. Right? That, that was more important, uh, no more important, uh, had more traction that the election of Obama as the first African-American president in history, because we're including election day, right? Um, you can say, everybody knows that Obama was elected, so why on earth, but okay, the margin, the this, the that, the backstage, or you know, the dress of Michelle, whatever, right? I mean, Grand Park, you know, the kids, Sasha, I mean, no, nothing. That's not measuring, as they say inside the newsroom. Uh, but Merlin Mack goes, and then we click. Yes and no, huh? because they get the, app, the, the apps from CNN and they get, so the, the engines that are producing most of their content still comes from here. Um, they are getting it in a different way, so yes, okay, but it's not completely unrelated, right? So the machine that feeds, the machinery that feeds is still more or less this machinery. So in 10 years how it will change? I have no idea, and neither do they. And anybody who tells you would, they would lie to you. I mean, so, so today I was talking to Eugenia, my collaborator, you know, we, are, we are starting a center in Argentina, so we, you know, I talked, I did a video conference on Skype in a taxi going to the airport. When I was a kid, that was science fiction, that was Dick Tracy, right? I mean, you look at the watch, etc. So in 15 years, what the world will be, but I think it will not be what we have, at least, some of the, most of the same players, it is fair to say if we apply traditional, conventional um, organizational analysis and market analysis that there will be many fewer news organizations, 
they will be much more smaller in terms of stuff and we have much lower levels of resources. Um, there will be a few which will be very large and the others will, will be niche. Um, and there will be lots of news content produced by algorithms. Um, and that if you keep your costs low, you still make money because in all business you can do that. But the world that we grew up in will no longer be in existence. What shape it will take, I don't know. But yeah, it's changing rapidly, very rapidly. Thank you, David. Yes. And so people will look at position number one. But it's already in two or three. Right. So, okay. Yes. The, 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 uh, you know, the follow-up debate to that is, is that information enough? Can we function? Because the aesthetics of our time is 140 characters, right? That's, that's the, I mean, as the symbol, right, of the world in part we live in, um, that, that is the symbol. So is that enough right. or not? Right? right? Um, and is it enough to consume political news during election times, right? What is the potential downside of the world as described by, by Michael Shatson as the world that exists? We, the, the downside is that a lot of the stuff that, is, that happens in politics is cooked continuously, right? During the 48 months of an administration, not during the electoral period. A lot of the stuff that is decided during the electoral period has been pre-cooked before, so if we are not paying attention and participating and liberating them, we are missing, right, on a possibility to influence that. So, um, yeah, it is possible, yes, I would pay more attention, right, maybe. Um, Mako. Just where? I'm not looking at the number. Okay. Where? So where it is displayed, right? Okay. Um, uh, do you think that that may be reflecting different models of consumption for different kinds of content as well? I'm just saying that, like, I expect to see in a Facebook feed mm -hmm. different kinds of stuff, um, even though that links to the New York Times, right? But the mm -hmm. kinds of things that I might expect as someone who reads the New York Times when I go to the New York Times, right? Mm -hmm. When I'm on Facebook and I'm, you know, uh, I'm speaking for I don't have a Facebook feed, but if I had a Facebook I might want to How do you know? Page, right? Yeah, that's right. Or when I'm looking on other kinds of websites like Reddit, I might be more interested in just something to kill some time, and so the kinds of things that I would want to yes. click on there would be different. And so what you're, what you might be capturing is the fact that yes. these sites no, are I producing different kinds of content that is being consumed in different ways by by different people, by by maybe the same people um, who are trying to do it in different ways, and that's just reflect that, and that's being reflected yes. in some of these numbers. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, and so. Uh, I'm not saying yes that I agree, but I say yes I understand. Okay, so I mean, <laughs> the question is, do you think that that's, um, I, I mean, I, I don't know, it's hard for me to believe that that would be driving the basic sort of, the, the, the basic pattern that you've described here. But uh, I don't know, do you think that that's... So no, that's, that's it. So I, yeah, it's a very good point. I take issue with the word producing for these sites because Facebook is not producing anything. Facebook's, Facebook is making it available. Okay. Facebook is not doing anything. People logging on Facebook, right? Okay. 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 So Reddit is not a major player here, but Facebook and Google are. Okay. We do not have information. We do not have primary data on that. But there are studies on, you know, Jay Hamilton, did a very interesting study way back when, I mean, way back when, it was 10 years ago, but now it seems an eternity, right? Um, but uh, of uh, search behavior 
right? Um, in search engines, right? And what, what is the kind of information that people want to know, right? Um, technologies have changed, etc. I am not prepared to believe that that has changed much, right? If you look at, if you say, okay, people are getting through the news by searching on Google, right? If you extrapolate from Jay's results, you see a much more dire picture than the one that I presented here. This is quite good, right? Okay? Facebook. Facebook is a, it's a little bit more complicated. Facebook polarizes these kind of choices. One of the limitations of our design is that we have aggregate server data. We don't have anything demographically, and we don't have anything that tracks you know, groups of people, etc. It is likely that the averages that I'm reporting here are, um, are not distributed normally, but we have you know, a peak of people, that 10 to 20 percent, which consume 80 to 90 percent of public affairs news, and the rest who consume much, much less. So Facebook exacerbates that effect. Like any site of that kind, not necessarily Facebook, any network, you are going to hang out or be connected right, to people who are more or less like you, right? Uh, in the same way that you live in neighborhoods of people that are more or less like you, go to, you know, houses of worship that speak to you and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So Facebook, I think, will probably, on the average, even it out, right? Uh, because the algorithm, I mean, I don't know it, but I'm assuming that if I click on a number of stories of this kind during three days, you know, when I leave my dog in, you know, doggy daycare, you know, they post videos, so to make sure that I see the videos, I click for a few days before, three or four times, and then I, they pop at the top of my Facebook feed, right? oh, my dog is doing well, I don't need to worry about it, right? So it does the same for news, okay? So it only exacerbates this, right? I mean, it, it's calls it constant and ex exacerbates the division, right? Which is something that I suspect, but I don't have any data about. But it's even worse. I mean, if you think that it's not, this is not really normally distributed, right? Uh, the picture is even worse. Yes? It's still at, I mean, the, the, the data that I've seen, not necessarily, maybe the times is different, but across the board, it's, it's at about 40, 35 to 40 percent. Uh, they're still getting the majority uh, there. Um, but it is on the decline, slow but steady, versus Google was on the decline and then it plateaued at the teens, right? And Facebook has been uh, going up. Um, maybe that's why, you know, they pay so much more attention there. But still is, um, it's still going a lot to the homepage, but that, that they can't really control. They do search, anti search engine optimization, this, that. They are, they are completely disintermediated. The story is, wh when you run a business that is part of an industry that is producing all the goods and getting only the crumbs in terms of the ads, you know that there is something that is not working, right? Um, and the, it's, it's it's not about the web. It started long before. Um, you know, penetration of newspapers in U.S. households have been going up since have been going down sorry, since the 50s, right? Um, there are other metrics as well, but it has greatly accelerated. Um, and they, they they seem I mean, at least the editors I've talked to, maybe your case is different, but they seem to be totally disoriented in terms of where to go and what to do, right? So, yes, Matt. I don't know. About occupational ideology that something that needs to be changed. But in this case, um, it seems like one of the suggestions that you're finding is that like, occupational ideology is some barrier to market demand response to forces. And so I'm wondering how you think about that just as someone who spent a lot of time in newsroom and also knows a lot of the problems that come along with that occupational ideology in terms of the way in which it ends up actually reporting on public Right. But the weaknesses are much, so what I would say about that is that, yes, we critical media scholars have paid a lot of attention to the weaknesses. I have written many papers, books, and won awards, etc. you know, on that. 50 years, we will look back at that, and we will lament a lot of what we have lost, I think, 
personally. That, that there's weaknesses where um, things that we love to write about, but not necessarily uh, the majority of what we see out there. So in terms of the advice, um, so honestly, I don't see any way out that would not involve a massive reduction, right? And a um, very different configuration of the work process. Very, very different configuration of the work process. Is it possible to make money on news online? Absolutely. Is it possible to make a lot of money on news online? Absolutely. But you need to spend very little money in order to make a lot of money. And these are organizations, the legacy organizations and the system in general, is a system that was built for a historical period in which these organizations operated as public utilities, essentially. And now there are no public utilities because you have a thousand taps, a thousand you know, faucets to, you know, to you know, decide which water you are drinking today. So, you know, and the, the mindset hasn't changed. So historically, and this is digitizing the news, right? Historically, news organizations had first pass at the world we live in, right? Historically, we are talking in the 70s, but even in the 90s, right? The Chicago Tribune, American Line, Steve Case, right? Needed money in the early 90s to you know, boost his business. So, so he came up with the idea of city guides, right? Um, so let's deploy AOL, which was mostly you know, an email service. Let's deploy it in different you know, uh, large and mid-sized metro markets as a combination of you, know, you email, you chat, and you have information about your restaurant, your movies, this and that. So he partnered with Tribune Corporation right, to deploy this service in Orlando, Atlanta, Chicago, etc. So, but he needed money. So the deal was, I'm, I'm selling you part of my company as, you know, through this deal. So he sold, I think it was 12% of AOL, right? In 1992 for 8 million, okay? Eight years later, AOL bought Time Warner, which is the largest publicly traded media company in the world before the world we live in, right? So news organizations had it for a long time, they just, because of occupational ideology and because of you know, the way of uh, looking at things, they lost it up until a point in which now I think they're beyond um, what they can uh, do to come back. Um, so that's one. The other thing that is important to keep in mind is, I think, is different occupations are fueled by different traits, right? Different ethos. So if you're going to go into the financial services sector, most likely it's greed what is motivating you. If you're going to become a journalist, it's a romantic vision of the world, right? That you are going to go and change the world. And you're going to do it despite all odds. So in a sense, the crisis and all of this only exacerbates the desire of people to go into this line of work. Now, the sustainability of the organizations, right, is different from the longevity of occupational culture. This romantic ethos fuels and is deeply connected to the occupational culture. So a few years ago, I, when I had like two of the studies, I was at a conference in Paris and one of my friends at Sciences Po invited me to give a talk for the journalism school there, right? So it's only a you know, graduate program, so I had students in the first and second year, right? So I give the talk and my friend, a uh, seasoned journalist, says, okay, what advice do you have to these youngsters about it? And I said, so half jokingly, well, you are young, you still have time to change careers. And uh, they all look at me, no, because I'm going to do uh, this and that, and I'm going to change and this. So I don't know, it's a long-winded answer. I don't have a recipe, but I do think that there is a very paradoxical way in which the very core of the occupational culture, right, is not only resistant to this, to, to change like all sort of cultures, but actually gets exacerbated, right, uh, in a situation like this, okay? Like I'm going to be the one, etc. The problem is what happens to the organizations, because these organizations have been firing, you know, newspapers have lost 30% of their staff in 20 years. That's a lot, right? Um, so uh, for the research that I'm doing on the demise of print newspapers, I was interviewing last year a fairly well-known editor at the Trib, the Chicago Tribune. What she says is that, you know, she told me, in her estimation, more than half of the staff at the Trib uh, is at any given point in time looking for a job. 
and she was so worried of being fired, and all the firings apparently take place on Friday at the trip, that she was always doing a story outside of the newsroom on Friday, so that magically she thinks she would avoid being fired, you know, because she wasn't in the newsroom. Right? Um, but half of your staff, uh, when half of your staff is looking actively for a job, the best people are going to go, right? Because they say, well, who can get jobs? And you stay with the worst people. Um, sorry, I don't have a more concrete answer. No, that's great. Well, why don't we transition to 1.6 uh, for uh, wine and refreshments? Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.